part of the modernism of the 1920s was a sense and a manifestation of liberation. There were actual liberation movements that um, were beginning to take hold in the 1920s. The, the most important part of this really and truly social and culturally, socially and culturally, is this idea that the other became mainstreamed. And we can see this in the cultural realm, in particular in the Harlem Renaissance and the Southern Renaissance of um, uh, literature and art and, and music. Um, the Harlem Renaissance was the first long lasting African-American impact on white dominated high culture. Let me say that again. The first time that African-American culture had made an impact, a lasting impact on high culture that was dominated by white Americans and by um, uh, cultural institutions and mechanisms uh, of transmitting culture that were the almost exclusive province of white Americans. This is not to say that African Americans didn't have a distinct and indeed vibrant culture, but it's the, the Harlem Renaissance is the first time that white culture um, uh, absorbed uh, some, some really significant influence from the black community. Um, this brought black high culture as well as nightlife uh, from Harlem uh, uh, in, in up city, uptown uh, New York, uh, Manhattan to the attention of white America. Uh, and it was an unusual and dynamic contribution or excuse me, combination of a critical mass of literati and artists with oppression and the resistance to oppression. One of the things that had created this critical mass of, of uh, intellect in Harlem was the, uh, was the influx of Southerners, of Southern Black people into Harlem and their um, they're, they're bringing of a sense of liberation as well as their challenge to the existing black middle class that lived in Harlem and the resulting friction uh, and attempts to work that out created both openings and motivation to many of these people to explore uh, their literary side, their artistic side, uh, their musical side, and to um, uh, and to, to create um, uh, expression that then was, uh, uh, was picked up sometimes as a commercial object by um, those people that held the levers of cultural power and cultural communication into the white mainstream culture. Um, there's some important people, and we'll look at, at uh, pictures of them in just a second, having to do with the Harlem Renaissance. There are a whole lot more than these, but these guys are just examples. Langston Hughes, the poet, Paul Robeson, the opera singer, Duke Ellington, who we mentioned earlier, um, the uh, uh, jazz pianist, and Zora Neale Hurston, a Florida immigrant, uh, who wrote uh, uh, short stories and novellas uh, and, and ultimately novels about her life in Florida for this uh, Harlem and New York uh, market. Another of these, uh, uh, another of these movements is the Southern Renaissance, which, like the Harlem Renaissance, emphasized an other, mainstreamed an other, and in this case, it was uh, the voice of the South, where the Harlem Renaissance had mainstreamed, at least temporarily, the the voice of African America. Um, the Southern Renaissance uh, mainstream the voice of the South. And, and we have uh, three or two actually uh, Im extremely important writers who, who moved the Southern Renaissance right along. Um, and that was, um, that was uh, William Faulkner and Thomas Wolfe. Now, there were a lot of other Southern writers as well. Um, they wrote of the South from Southerners' points of view. And the important thing, this concept of mainstreaming, is that they were 
they were published and they had a national market. They had a voice throughout the nation. That is, people in other places paid attention to them. People outside of Harlem um, paid attention to uh, Zora Neale Hurston and, and um, uh, Langston Hughes as writers. They paid attention to William Faulkner and Thomas Wolfe as writers. And let's look at some of these folks. A slide here showing Langston Hughes on the left, uh, the poet um, who wrote about what he knew in black life and in Harlem. Uh, Paul Robeson uh, in the middle, uh, 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 an incredible baritone uh, who later became uh, a communist and was caught up in the Red Scare of the 1950s. Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, top right, and Duke Ellington uh, below. And for the Southern Renaissance, William Faulkner and Thomas Wolfe are the, the, probably the most important writers. Catherine Ann Porter represents uh, not so much a unique voice as opens a gateway to Southern women writers uh, who followed her, an extremely natural writer that as she wrote um, um, uh, in it, in a in a natural patois about the things around her, she was a realistic writer. That is a, a, a writer of realism. Whereas Faulkner invented these worlds that seemed real. Wolf and Porter uh, uh, wrote about their real worlds that were barely disguised um, experience. Then um, we we have the 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 conflict here of the Southern Renaissance and Southern agrarians, who in the late 1920s, 12 um, authors uh, from Robert Penn Warren to Alan Pate um, and, and many others, uh, hovering around uh, Vanderbilt University in one form or another, wrote in, in resistance to the new commercialization, the new industrial society that was permeating uh, their older uh, Southern society so deeply. Uh, and the fact that they wrote, I'll take my stand, a, um, a Southern agrarian manifesto, um, which is, is being critiqued here in this book, um, is really a reaction and is politically and culturally reactionary. It's not liberating as much as it is in the sense that we might mean it, uh, but it is a resistance to what these folks see as, um, uh, as an alien culture that will not only destroy their uh, culture, uh, of the somewhat patrician culture of the South, uh, but bring some things with it that are not universally good. Um, some of this is tinged with racism. Some of it is, um, is, is tinged with just lost cause mythology. But because of the intellectual power of these writers, um, and they're, re they're fairly deep thinkers, you, you really have to take what they say seriously and examine it seriously. You can't just brush it off as a bunch of old codgers who uh, long for sipping mint juleps on the veranda, which sometimes is how uh, scholars uh, look at these, at these people. Now, you don't have to agree with their reactionary um, concept, but, but a lot of times we've incorporated a number of their ideas uh, even into um, uh, modern day, well, what we would consider to be today, modern day um, uh, liberal and even radical uh, leftist politics. For example, the concept of small human scale versus giantism. Well, that that's directly out of I'll take my stand. It's not directly out of it as much as it is just uh, uh, concurrent with it. Um, that idea that human size is better than giantism, that idea that, uh, that commercialism isn't the only value. That's, that's what these guys were talking about, too. Um, if you follow them to their logical conclusion, you may not like it, um, but, but they were part and parcel of, this, of, of Southern writers who 
saw the new world coming and, and resisted it. So they're kind of odd for the way I'm approaching this um, uh, this lecture, which is almost um, uh, Whig history that that all change is progress. And, and I put them in here to indicate that not all writers who may have been extremely good and deep thinking writers um, bought into this new um, world that was a borning with the um, uh, with with giant industrialization and uh, uh, with with urbanization. So they're they're pretty interesting as a counterpoint uh, to the direction that American society was going. At the same time, they are very modern. They offer a modernist critique of modernism. Go figure that one out. Uh, there were specific mobilizations for liberation. There, there was, in the 1920s, a very distinct women's movement. Now, now you may think that, that well, geez, women, women got the right to vote in 1920. So what are they complaining about? Well, it took a while for them to actually be allowed to vote. Uh, and there was much more to it than just securing uh, the vote. The vote was a very small part of the women's movement uh, from 1848. Uh, it was just the part that that drew a lot of attention after about 1910. The uh, the women's movement continued on um, when when the suffragists won, and their tactics were very conservative. For example, um, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt who had taken over the suffrage movement um, in 1910 and then, and then again after 1915 and was successful, um, urged Congress to allow women to vote so that white women would dilute the influence of immigrants and blacks who were being given the vote um, in the North in particular. Um, after, after suffrage was successfully won, then um, the, the suffrage movement became the League of Women Voters, which we still have with us today and promotes nonpartisan, nonpartisan electoral processes uh, and candidates forums and, and things like that, uh, and is very valuable, particularly at the local level, uh, where sometimes it's hard to get information about candidates um, and about political stances. Um, but after suffrage, um, one of the radical suffragists, Alice Paul, who had been incarcerated for uh, protesting and had been force-fed uh, along with others uh, who had been protesting out in front of um, uh, the White House in favor of suffrage, broke away and um, established a political party called the Women's Political Party and, uh, excuse me, the Women's Party. And they um, campaigned for an Equal Rights Amendment, ERA, that was picked back up in the 1970s and just about became part of the Constitution. We actually will talk about this when we discuss the 1970s and the conservative um, um, uh, backlash uh, in the 1970s. Um, Another uh, uh, person important to the women's movement of the progressive era and after is Margaret Sanger, who you see pictured here, who was a birth control advocate and in fact had to flee the United States for a number of years uh, because she was uh, um, uh, she was being prosecuted for um, uh, uh, for, for violating postal laws by sending birth control information through the mail. Um, and she was also a eugenics proponent, which is something that um, um, that uh, modern day anti uh, contraceptive folks usually point their their finger and shake their finger at her about. Um, yes, she was a eugenics uh, proponent. That is the idea that you can purify the race, and, and whether the race is is with with uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, the master race of Aryans, or with Margaret Sanger, the human race, by um, uh, by not allowing inferior individuals to breed. Now, there's all kinds of problems when you start 
uh, uh, talking about inferior individuals and who gets to decide who's inferior. Um, and, and that's a big problem with the eugenics movement. Uh, Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood. And like I said, a lot of these ideas, a lot of these things that began in the modern, uh, in the 1920s as part of the modern era, um, really have long legs and we're, we're still dealing with them today. Um, we see the rise of African-American separatism. With the end of World War I, many of the uh, African-American troops came home having fought for democracy. Many African-Americans who had had to demonstrate hyper-patriotism found themselves what they thought of as cheated um, by an America that said, thank you for your help, thank you for your patriotism, now go back to what you were. Um, they were disappointed at returning to strong Jim Crowism um, uh, in, in the immediate post-World War I era. Uh, there was active uh, suppression of the African-American voice, even as the Harlem Renaissance brought African-American voices of a certain type to the attention of white America in many other places, African-American voices and particularly political activity was actively suppressed. Uh, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, fell on hard times. They were, for the most part, um, integrationists. They, yeah, you know, I, it, it, it's a little hard to call them uh, integrationists from the very beginning, but um, they understood that you worked within the system to change the system. Um, they were not particularly an enamored of, uh, as an organization, of the concept of separate but equal. They realized early on that equal didn't occur when separate um, uh, occurred. So with the, with the downgrading of uh, the NAACP, with this disappointment, we find in some places uh, the rise of African-American separatism as a liberation movement. And we can particularly say this uh, when we talk about Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association. Garvey, who you see pictured here in his uniform as um, commander in chief of, um, uh, of the African American Legion, uh, then a, a militia outfit, not really in the way that we think of it um, uh, today, um, was a Jamaican immigrant and uh, who, who advocated that African Americans pay attention to their own institutions. Uh, this was in the wake of black migration to the North and, and further repression in the South. Um, Garvey and the UNIA were the loudest voice during the early 1920s for, um, for this idea of, um, of, of stop worrying about what white people want and begin building your own institutions um, that can support you. Uh, this was a, a message directly counter to the NAACP as well as, uh, and, and W.E.B. Du Bois, as well as to um, um, the accommodationist rhetoric of the Tuskegee folks and uh, Booker T. Washington and Robert Moton and Emmett Scott. Um, this was a third voice outside of that debate. Um, and Marcus Garvey said, just, just forget about white people and white institutions. Make your own and make them strong. This is an antecedent to the um, 1970s Black is Beautiful movement. Um, Garvey also led a Back to Africa movement um, that was controlled by African Americans, this didn't take up anywhere, but what really did work was um, uh, that he advocated building black owned businesses and creating black uh, owned institutions within segregation. Um, just, it's not a matter of accepting segregation, it's a matter of just ignoring anything else. Um, he advocated building black owned businesses. He, um, uh, he created the Black Star Steamship Line as well as a, num a number of other um, 
uh, businesses. The um, uh, ultimately, however, he was arrested and convicted and imprisoned, um, and ultimately deported back to Jamaica for fraud in connection with the um, Black Star steamship line. His wife uh, stayed in the United States um, uh, after his conviction and deportation and um, continued to try to run both the UNIA and the Black Star Steamship Line and did so for a number of years, but eventually uh, these businesses fell apart with the advent of the uh, Great Depression. Okay, so we have looked at um, uh, uh, at, at liberation movements, the uh, mainstreaming of the others in uh, Blacks in the Harlem Renaissance and uh, uh, Southerners in the Southern Renaissance. Uh, we've also looked at uh, women's liberation movement um, that accelerated in the 1920s and um, Black separatism that, in, that accelerated in the 1920s as well. So again, thank you for your attention.